to God's word now. And before we do that, let me lead us in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to meet together. We thank you now for your word. And we pray that you will help us this morning to hear what you have to say to each one of us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be looking this morning at just a very short passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you've got a Bible, it'd be great if you could have that open in front of you. Uh, but I'm going to share um, my screen now just so that you can see the passage. Hopefully you can see that. Just three verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. And Paul says these words. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Well, you might think that's a slightly strange passage. I'm not sure that I've ever heard it preached on. But I'm hoping it's going to help us this morning as we think about what it means to be part of a church family and to be church members. That is our topic this morning. Uh, during these uh, couple of months, we've been looking at different aspects of being church. And in our church particularly, church membership is very important because in our church, uh, we believe Christ is the ultimate authority. But the way that we discern Christ's will together is through our church members. It's the church members who have the ultimate authority under God to discern what goes on in this church. We don't have a bishop over us. Even me as the minister, I don't have the ultimate authority. It's the church members who decide who the minister's going to be. It's the church members who appoint the deacons. It's the church members who make important decisions about the life of our church family. In practice, a lot of those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis get delegated to, to me and the deacons and other people, but it's the church members who have the responsibility for discerning God's will for our church. So it's a really important role. And Paul said in the first verse in that passage, now it is required that those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. And those of us who are church members have been given a trust. We've been given a responsibility to care for to discern God's will for our church family. We've been given this trust, literally um, in Paul's language, it's as if we've been made a steward over a household, each of us together as church members. And membership of a church like ours is not like being a member of, for example, a, a sports club or a gym or, or the National Trust or whatever else you're a membership of. It's not that uh, we sort of, you know, we pay our subs and then that gives us the sort of option to, to turn up now and then and use the facilities when we feel like it. That's not the kind of membership that we're talking about in terms of a church. It's much more in terms of the kind of trust that we have when we enter a marriage relationship. It's a covenant relationship we enter into to care for one another, to be committed to one another. And therefore, faithfulness matters in this kind of membership. It's a membership that is something we are completely committed to, to one another, to our church family, to seeing our church family flourishing. And that's what church members are. They are people who've decided, not that they're more spiritual or they're more special than anyone else, but they've decided that we're completely committed to this church family and we take responsibility for seeing that God's will is done here. Now, the purpose of this morning is not, uh, it's not a recruitment drive for church members. If you feel that God's calling you into membership, then do come and talk to me or to Anne or to one of the deacons. We've actually got several people who've applied to church membership in the last few months, and we haven't been able to do anything with that because we can't actually have a church members meeting at the moment because under our rules that has to be in person. But it's great that we have, I think, five or six people who've asked for membership, and we hope uh, to be able to welcome them properly into membership shortly. But it may be that God's calling you this morning to be a member, or maybe he's not. Uh, it is a serious role, and in a sense, we, want, we only want people to be members if you're fully committed to this church and to playing your part in uh, serving the church and in seeing the church serve God's purposes. But I want to, I've been reflecting, I guess, the last week or two is what I'm going to say this morning. And I suppose I've been thinking about the fact that I, I look around our church members, particularly, 
and I see folk who are incredibly committed. I see folk who are burning themselves out. And I see perhaps others who, are, who seem as if perhaps they're slightly bailing out. They're, they've perhaps lost a bit of enthusiasm about what it means to be a member of our church. And, and both of those things worry me. And so this morning, I want to go back in a way to the basics, basics that apply to us whether we're church members or not church members, but which are particularly crucial for those of us who are called into any kind of position of responsibility and leadership and faithfulness and stewardship in the church. So let's look back at that passage that we uh, have already seen. I'll put it back on the screen again. And I'm just going to go through it clause by clause, as it were. So the first sentence, which in a sense we've already thought about, now it's required that those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. But what does Paul then go on to say? Well, he talks about himself briefly. He says, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Now this sounds good, doesn't it? This speaks to what we want to hear, particularly I think in the modern world. Uh, we're constantly being told that we must not let ourselves be judged by others. It's not what others think that matters. It's what I think. In a sense, I think this, this lies at the heart of a lot of modern psychology. Don't listen to what others are saying about you. You decide for yourself who you want to be. You, you need to be the master of your destiny. You need to decide who you are. You need to set your own identity. The answer to, to criticism and to anxiety is to boost our own self-esteem, to blank out the voices around us, to talk positively, to speak positively to ourselves. But actually, that's not what Paul's saying. And I think that message, which actually we hear quite a lot in our age, talk yourself up, blank out what everyone else is saying, believe in yourself, that's not what Paul thinks. And I think Paul is coming on to tell us that that's a trap, quite a dangerous trap that we can fall into, whether we're young and inexperienced or whether we're, we're old and we've been a, a church member for years and years, we can still fall into this trap that thinking that what I think about myself is the most important thing of all. What does Paul go on to say? Indeed, I do not even judge myself. So I don't let others judge me, but I also don't judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. Paul's saying, I recognise that I need to be quite careful, not only what other people think of me, but also what I think about myself, because I could have a clear conscience and still be in the wrong. No doubt all kinds of bad people in history have had clear consciences, and, and that didn't make them any more right. In fact, it made them even more dangerous. It's not about what others think of me, but it's also not about what I think of me in the kingdom of God. In the church, in God's family, I need to stop seeing everything through the lens of myself. And that's a hard thing to do because that goes to the root of what sinfulness is. It goes to the root of what our problem is as human beings, is that we tend to see everything through the lens of ourselves, how things impact us, and so on. Actually, low self-esteem and high self-esteem can both be serious problems. Historically, in generations past, it was high self-esteem that people thought was the big problem. Um, pride and, and bigging yourself up was seen as a, as, a, as a real issue and to be frowned upon and to be strongly discouraged. In our times, we tend to focus on low esteem as the big self-esteem as being the big problem. We need to big ourselves up. We need to encourage ourselves because that goes to the root of what our problems are. But that's not what Paul says. The Holy Spirit, you see, does not make me think more of myself or less of myself. The Holy Spirit simply makes me think of myself less. The Holy Spirit makes me think of myself less, stops me focusing on myself 
and my thoughts and my desires and my feelings and my frustrations and the slights and grudges and stuff that happened to me, the Holy Spirit helps me to focus on others. There's a great little book. I don't know if you've come across it. It's only got about 20 pages. You can read it in a few minutes. Um, if we were meeting physically, I, I might think you can buy them for a pound. I might, I might actually buy everybody a copy, but we can't. But I would commend it to you if you can get hold of a copy. Tim Keller's The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. The amazing liberation that we can experience when we just stop focusing on ourselves so much. I'm plagiarizing a certain amount of what Keller writes in his book this morning. One thing he points out is that Paul was an extraordinary man by any standards. Paul was probably one of the most influential men in human history. He had extraordinary drive and ability. Uh, he had extraordinary confidence. He had extraordinary energy. And yet, writing to Timothy, he said, I am the worst of all sinners. He had extraordinary self-insight as well. And for Paul, his sinfulness and his identity were not connected. He knew he was a great sinner, and yet that did not, ident that did not become his identity. His identity was who he was in Christ. His ego, which could have been massive because of his extraordinary skills, had gone quiet. Uh, Keller, Keller, in this little book, uh, gives an interesting illustration. He says that you only feel part of your body when there's something wrong with it. So if there's, I mean, we, uh, Mark Huseman, for example, one of our, our members, uh, needs a knee, knee replacement operation. And at the moment, the thing that he feels the whole time are his knees. And we, we pray desperately that he'll be able to have his operation soon. But you know the same, don't you? you? You cut your finger, and what is it that you can feel? It's your finger throbbing, telling you all the time, pay me attention. You have, a, you have a pain in your foot or your back or wherever, and it's that thing that's shouting to you. And Keller says the problem many of us have is that our ego is shouting at us. And the reason the ego is shouting at us is because our ego is not healthy. It's the unhealthy parts of our body that shout loudest. And for many of us, it's our egos. It's the thing that says, it's about me. It's about how much recognition I'm getting. It's about what people think of me. That thing is, is hurting and therefore it's shouting and therefore it needs healing. I can be wrongly content with myself, but I can be wrongly discontent with myself. I can say, well, I'm going to set my own standards. I'm going to blank out what everyone else is thinking. But actually, the problem is that when I set my own standards for myself, I fail to live up to them too. So maybe I downplay my own standards and, and reduce them so that I can live up to them. And then I'm upset because I realize what low standards I have for myself. We get into a terrible trap when we focus on what we think of ourselves. C.S. Lewis makes a very interesting observation. C.S. Lewis said, if you ever met a truly Christ-like person, you would not be struck by their humility. Because when, you, when you're struck by someone's humility, it tends to be because they're, they're making a bit of a thing about it. C.S. Lewis says, if you met a truly Christ-like person, you would be struck by how interested that person was in you. If you met a truly Christ-like person, you'd be struck by how interested that person was in you. Because for that person themselves would have gone out of the picture and they'd be focusing on you. Now, we might be thinking, well, well that's great. I'd love to be able to, to not worry what other people think about me. I'd, be, I'd love to not worry what I think about myself, but, but, but I can't help it. My, my ego is still throbbing. It's still shouting at me. So, so what's the way out of this? What's the good news in this message this morning? Well, there is good news, but the good news, you might think, comes in an un unlikely place because it comes in the final verse of our little reading. Paul says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. He also says, 
And I've decided that judging myself is no good either because that's not reliable. And he finishes by saying, it is the Lord who judges me. And we might think, well, well that's the last thing I want to hear. All this talk about judgment and, and God, he's the perfect one. So if he's judging me, I'm really in a difficult way. Why is it good news that it's God who is the ultimate judge? Well, it's good news because the verdict that God places upon us is already in. God is not waiting for our performance as church members or in any other way to decide what he thinks of us. God has already decided what he thinks of us. God has already uh, pronounced his verdict upon us. And his verdict upon us is innocence because he sees in us the righteousness of Christ. That word at the end of the, the, the previous verse there, but that does not make me innocent. This, this is the New International Version translation. But the, the word that Paul uses in the Greek, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most important words in the New Testament. And in most cases in English, it will be translated with a word like justified. We don't have a good word in English really to express this truth, but it's the word that says, I have been counted righteous. I have been, I am seen by God as if I were completely right and innocent and perfect. It's the justify word. I have been justified. And when the Lord judges me, he's not judging me to, to point out all the wrong things I've done. He's judging me with a judgment he has already made because of Christ. I have been pronounced righteous because of him. And because of this, I'm free. I'm free to live. I'm free to serve in the local church. I'm free to do this secure on the basis of a verdict that has already been given. And therefore, I'm not trying to grab status. I'm not trying to wind myself up into more and more feverish activity so as to please God. Neither am I um, turning away in, in, in frustration because I've tried all that and I've realized that actually I'm just burning myself out. And therefore I start to distance myself. I start to retreat into my own world. I give up a little bit. I don't do any of those things because I rest secure in the fact that my identity has been given to me by God. And it is the identity of innocence, of perfection, of justification, of righteousness. Somebody snubs me. Somebody doesn't notice the stuff I do. I feel worthless within myself. I remember what God says about me. I remember that Jesus has been tried in my place. And it's on the basis of that that I am judged. So this is good news, isn't it? And you might think, well, what's all this got to do with church membership? Well, it's just that we as church members need to be the ones who are modeling this above all. We're not modeling high status. We're not modeling uh, people working more feverishly than anyone else. We are to be the people who model the gospel, that our worth is not in what we do. Our worth is not in what we say we are. Our worth is not in what anyone else says we are. Our worth is in what God says we are. And the fact that God has judged us and has judged us in Christ and has pronounced us righteous and holy and pure and clean. So what does church membership mean? Well, it means serving faithfully, as we saw right at the start of the passage. It means serving as faithful stewards in God's church. But it means serving out of a place of security, out of a place of knowing who we are and knowing what God declares us to be. And my prayer is that each one of us, whether we're church members or not, is that we really get that that the Holy Spirit really seals this truth onto our hearts. So that when we go outside our church, when we meet people, whether it's online or in the flesh, whether it's at school and college, in our workplaces, in our community, in Foodback, wherever it is, 
people see this good news, this joyfulness bubbling out of us. They see a bunch of people who are secure in our identity in Christ, who don't worry what anyone else thinks of us, who don't even worry what our own inner selves think of us, but we worry what God thinks of us, and we're concerned above all with him, and we know com with complete assurance and security that God loves us, and he calls us his children. Isn't that good news? Wouldn't that want to motivate us to serve him better inside the church and outside it? I hope so. And I hope for those of us who are feeling a bit jaded, a bit worn out, a bit, um, a bit unable to cope, that we will rest secure in this glorious identity we have in God. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that it's not about us, it's about you. I thank you this morning for every member of Haywards Heath Baptist Church, for the way in which they serve and honour you. But I pray that you'll help each one of us, and I include myself in this, not to serve in order to get praise from anyone else, not to serve because we need to justify ourselves to ourselves, but to serve because of who we know we are in you and what we know that you have done for us and who you say we are. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will seal these truths on our hearts so that those days when we're tempted to doubt it, when we're tempted to think bad things, when we're tempted to think inaccurately about ourselves, that you will remind us of the truth, that we are innocent, that we are justified. And I pray for those this morning who might be being challenged to become members of our church in the sense of taking on responsibility for discerning your will for our church community, for holding to our leaders to account, for meeting together, for giving financially, for praying, for serving in other ways. I pray for those who you might be calling into that role, that you will guide them, but help them too to enter into this responsibility with the right attitude, that it's all about you and not about us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.